Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to Planet IMEX, the October edition. My name is Natasha Richards. I'm the Senior Advocacy and Industry Relations Manager for IMEX. And it is my pleasure to introduce today's session, Digital, Pon Digital Sponsorship Possibilities. During the session, I encourage you to use the chat as much as you like, but ask that you use Slido for questions for our speaker today. You can access Slido on the left of the video feed on a desktop and below the video feed on a mobile device. Our speaker has worked for and with some of the biggest brands we all know. Her career spans several markets, including hotel, CVB, industry associations, event technology, and strategic partnerships, where she has been both a buyer and a seller. Phase Forward is a sponsorship management company specializing in sponsorship strategy, prospectus, and pipeline development and sales. To get outdoors and away from the laptop, Meg is a competitive dragon boat racer. She has competed in two world races and numerous national championships. It is my pleasure to introduce Meg Fazy. Thank you, Natasha. I appreciate that nice welcome. And thank you, IMAX, for having me. And of course, you know, we all would love to be in my second home, Las Vegas, right now. But uh, this is really a great option. And uh, thank you for, for um, having me. So I want to jump right in. I um, have a limited amount of time and I want to talk about a lot today. Um, we're going to talk about digital sponsorship. I want to um, start off by talking about just strategy and creating a, a robust strategy. I want to get into a little bit of kind of where we are and best practices and then jump into the fun part, which are all the digital options. Um, and then we are leaving a, a lot of time uh, at the end for questions, which Natasha is nice enough to help me with. So let's get started. So sponsorship strategy, you know, I, I often see when I'm working with a, with a customer that they have an event marketing strategy or they have an attendee acquisition strategy, but very rarely do they have a sponsorship strategy. And I just think this is crucial. And understanding, you know, starting with understanding your marketing goals and objectives from your organization standpoint, but then what your event standpoint is as well, and then keeping them in mind when you're bringing in your sponsors. Um, resources, knowing your resources, and I don't just mean financial, I actually am speaking more about staffing resources, especially now, and understanding that you are, you know, the, the amount of staff you have to create a robust uh, sponsorship strategy may need kind of a step up approach. And so you might want to go kind of lean the first year and then, you know, have a strategy a little bit more for the second year, just making sure that you're utilizing your staffing resources the right way. And then culture. And I, you know, there isn't an event event person that doesn't know their organization's culture. However, I think it's really important that you keep in mind your culture when you're thinking about your sponsorship strategy, because you want to make sure that whoever you are bringing in and putting in front of your attendee is going to offer value. And so you want to make sure that that sponsor speaks to your culture. When I look at um, creating a sponsorship strategy, I look at what the goals are first, of course, you know, and here are the three main goals that, that most organizers would look at. They want to know, how do I bring in new sponsors? How do I drive for higher revenue? And of course, how do I um, increase my attendee engagement? So this is when I'm working with an organization, this is where we start. When we're looking at acquiring new sponsors, first thing I do, low hanging fruit, go for those competitive shows, see who is sponsoring there that is not sponsoring at other conferences, or at, I'm sorry, at your conference. Um, same with like organizations, are there sponsors at organizations that aren't in your competitive set, but, but drive the same type of sponsor? and, and uh, contact them. And every time I reach out for an attendee referral, I always get a great, a handful of great um, sponsorship because so many attendees want their um, suppliers or vendors to be part of the conference. So I always get some great attendee referrals. And then non-endemic. So non-endemic, for those who don't know, non-endemic sponsors are those sponsors who don't necessarily sit within your um, market segment, but they share the same type of attendee. So for example, if you are, um, 
you know, utilizing, say for your virtual event, you are shipping things to people's homes. Maybe FedEx makes sense to bring in as a sponsor. Um, if, if you offer the same type of attendee that uses FedEx's services. Um, I had to do a little BBC action for my for my friends at IMAX. Um, but if we, you know, we're moving closer to a broadcast system in a lot of these virtual events, does it make sense to bring in um, some type of news show to partner with? So they would be non-endemic sponsors. And then retaining um, retaining your sponsors. Um, when I'm doing a in-person event. Um, we look at, I do a lot of, most of my businesses in the tech segment. So I, we do a lot of with um, succession plans and bringing in startup companies and creating opportunities for them. You could do the same thing in the virtual world in creating small opportunities. Like we would create a small opportunity on the show floor. It can be done on the virtual floor as well. And it's a smaller buy-in for, for startups or for new companies, one first timers. Um, and, you know, but it's also a smaller exposure to your attendees. And then you, then the next year, if you drive value for them, they will have a bigger buy. And that's how you create a succession plan. You know, I've been in sales for 25 years and we have always said that it is so much easier to keep a client than, um, then have to go get a client, right? It's it's easier, it's cheaper to keep a client. Same holds for sponsors. So you wanna try and keep the sponsors you have and then grow them year after year into bigger buys. And then also retaining clients. I think micro surveys and focus groups are a great way to retain sponsors because especially now what a lot of a lot of organizations have seen is that the organizations that have treated their sponsors like partners and brought them into conversations have done pretty well through this, um, where if you are, uh, if you um, speak to your sponsors, if, they, if it's just a commodity sell to them, they may choose to pick another conference to go to, to where they are more, where they feel like more partners. So re to retain clients, bring them close, have uh, create micro surveys, have focus groups with them, ask them how they're feeling, what their needs are. I think it's a great way. And then to drive revenue. So one of the first things I do when I'm working with an organization is I, I go right to their to their prospectus and I look at what are they selling and what what are the expenses associated with those items? And then what are we pricing them at? So very often, very, very often <laughs> what I'm finding is that pricing in the world has gone up and yet the pricing of the sponsorship has not. So, for instance, you know, coffee goes up every year, but the coffee break price did not. So right there, if we make some some small changes, we can retain some revenue just by doing an, an audit on your prospectus. Um, bringing in experiential opportunities. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, but that's a great way to drive some revenue. Non-endemic, again, great way to drive some re revenue. And in the virtual world, repurposing content is an unbelievably smart way to drive revenue. You can slice and dice content so many different ways that it's it's just kind of a no-brainer and a great opportunity. From attending engagement, um, you know, what we're finding is the organization has to, the event has to have robust content. And, um, you know, they say content is, is king. Right now I'm thinking, what is higher than king? So, okay, goddess. So content is goddess. Um, so because when I am at a conference and I'm walking down the, down the um, pre-function area and I may be speaking with a client and we want to go into a session and we go in and, okay, so the content may not be as great as we wanted, we're still staying. I'm staying. I'm with my client. I'm not going to get up and, and move. Guess what? At home, I'm going to get up and move. So content is real. The content really has to be robust. We're also seeing that resources attendees want to have resources when they when they sit down to attend a virtual conferences. So, you know, the sponsors need to offer great resources. And then we need to create consumable content. So, you know, are you just creating keynotes and breakouts or are you creating, you know, lightning rounds and birds of a feather and round tables and and different opportunities for your audience to 
um, consume the content in the way that they're comfortable with and the time limits that they're comfortable with? And then are they sponsorable? And a lot of content we're seeing is changing into being able to offer some sponsorship around the content. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And then community, of course, creating the community. I mean, you know, isn't that why we all get together face to face and, and uh, you know, it's to see each other. And like I started out by saying, I miss seeing everybody at IMAX in Vegas every year. Um, so creating the community is really important when you're driving engagement. So I just want to step back and kind of level set the conversation and going in when we go into the next segment, which is the digital options. So, you know, in the beginning, and, and I'm saying in the beginning and kind of laughing at that because virtual has been around for a long time, but in the beginning was last March for most of us, let's be honest. You know, there was a lot of confusion. We had no history. Um, we didn't know what opportunities were available for a sponsor. We had no idea how to price them. I mean, no idea. And really the focus was like, how do we keep our community together? So that that's where we kind of were, you know, the, the you know, Q2 of, of last year. And this is what we did for community. I mean, how many happy hours did you guys do, you know, the, the first couple uh, months? I was on at least two a night, right? And just trying to hold on to, you know, have great conversation with people and really make sure that I'm, I was feeling community, you know, feeling that connection, that community. And now I'm, I don't even do like one happy hour, maybe a, a month. So, so we're changing and we're looking at things that are different. You know, we did a lot of care packages at home. We did a lot of team building environments. So the community um, aspect of virtual is very important. It certainly was very important in the beginning of, um, of the pandemic and it, and it continues to be, but it's changing a little bit. So what have we learned? Where are we now? Um, so digital as a medium is very different and that's what we've learned. We can't take our conference and put a three day conference in, from a live perspective into a digital experience and expect to have the same results. We can't expect for our sponsors to um, jump at an ex a, a virtual expo the way they do a live expo. You know, there's just a lot of sponsor reluctance around around virtual. Um, you know, we are programmed to be face to face and that's where the value is. And, you know, again, I've been in the industry for 25 years. I'm not gonna argue that face to face is, you know, the, the number one incredible value that we all get from, from this industry and, and sales and marketing. However, that doesn't mean it's the only opportunity and, and virtual really does offer some great opportunity for sponsors. Um, and that's where the analytics come in. So, um, you know, we've learned that analytics is, are so important and we're not quite there yet, um, but we will be there. The, the, we need to provide better and more analytics to our sponsors to make it, to give them the ROI they need. And then pricing. We still haven't learned a lot about pricing, quite honestly. Um, it is still very difficult to, to um, price sponsorships. And, and I can talk about that in just a minute. So where where are we going? Um, we're you know clearly everyone I talk to says that we are you know they're going to have a hybrid or an integrated experience. So it'll be live and or I should say in person because I'm live right now, and yet it's digital. Um, so in person um, and a digital experience at all their conferences. And you know it's interesting the attendee. What we're seeing from attendee um, growth is that um, two or or more often three times the amount of people are attending conferences when, uh, since it, when it's digital. So what we're expecting when it goes live or in person is those numbers are not gonna drop. In fact, we're expecting those numbers to increase because now organizations have seen that, okay, I normally just spend, send two of my salespeople to this event. Now I can send two people to an event and I can have my whole team on board to watch it online. So we're expecting really attending growth to really just continue to skyrocket. And, and um, you know, the other thing is robust online experience. Again, we go back to the content, but it's not just it's not just the educational content. It's every part of the online experience needs to be engaging. People are not willing after all this, you know, calls that we have conference calls and webinars that we have all day to just sit on a, on and look at a screen all day. You have to keep them engaged. 
content again content holds holds uh you know the future everything is going to be about the content and then we're also looking at how how we are um, presenting a lot of our content we think that it's um going to be more from a broadcast news type of of consumption and so that's that's kind of an interesting way to look at it so where does that leave sponsorship? So sponsorship, what what the number one thing, as I said this earlier, is direct sale direct sales opportunities. So when I'm working with organizations and I say, you know, um, is there can we create some sort of sponsored content? And you know, so many organizations, no, we don't provide sponsored content. You know, we're we're very clear about that, and I 100% agree with them. Normally, and in person, I would agree with them. Digital, I disagree with them. I think if you market it as sponsorship, you can, uh, you, you know, you're not trying to, you know, kind of sneak in a commercial to anybody. You really are making it a sponsorship content track. Then you can do that. So there's different opportunities, but I think it's really important that the, that we start looking at how we're offering ROI for sponsors and analytics is right there. So um, attendee lists is one of the hottest topics um, that has come up in the last couple of months when it's come to virtual and the analytics around that. Um, you know, we are we are conditioned not to provide uh, attendee lists. There are rules around providing attendee lists. There's you know regulations, all of that. But I think that the, that there um, there are organs. There's ways to kind of get around that a little. Not get around that. I don't mean that like we're breaking laws. But I mean I think there are opportunities to offer um, attendee information that is that is approved uh, to sponsors because I think you know the analytics of and I have a whole list at the end of different analytics that we'll look at. But analytics is crucial to um, driving ROI for sponsors. Um, sponsor goals and resources. You know, the sponsor goal, the sponsor goal and resources are very different now, right? So where they had to create, you know, maybe a, they had a 45 by 40 booth or a 20 by 20 booth. What did that cost them? What were they trying to achieve? All of that changes in a virtual world. And so we need to we need to look at that differently. It's not just about taking an exhibitor from a um, in person event and putting them in a virtual. We really have to think about how we approach them differently. Pre and post opportunities are one of the best things to come out of virtual in my perspective. There are so many pre and post opportunities that we can take a, advantage of in a virtual world that we can't really take advantage of in, in an in-kind. You know, and I said it earlier, we're seeing that 37% of uh, attendees are going back to consume um, to consume content after the conference. So there's a lot of opportunities for sponsorships. So let's talk about digital options, my favorite part, and I'm sure your favorite part. Um, so when I think about, you know, creating a prospectus with digital options, um, you know, the, I, again, I look at three different types of sponsors. You have a branding sponsor, expo sponsor, and an experiential sponsor. So what do we have for each one of them that really drives some really cool ROI? Um, so the branding sponsor, you know, that branding sponsor is, is clearly the one that, you know, wants their name front and center, right there on the banner, um, check out their logo, see their branding, you know, and, and in an, in a, in an in law in person event, they don't get a lot of, uh, ROI. However, in a virtual, they are like kids in a candy store, right? So they can, they know who's seeing, who's seeing their banner. They can do calls of action. They can do all kinds of things. So the branding sponsor really gets a lot out of a virtual event. So here are some idea, uh, opportunities and ideas. Um, many of uh, which, which people are, have been doing the pop up bad manners, the banners. But, you know, I would say take it one step further and, and put a call to action. Um, on your banners or your pop-up ads, direct messaging, you know, speaker backgrounds, countdown clocks are very cool. Community boards, um, transition slides, you know, from one from breakout to a breakout, uh, lower thirds on a keynote, um, commercials, like I talked about earlier. So uh, one of the one of the hottest tickets that I'm creating and and it's selling is doing a 60 second or a 30 second commercial prior to a keynote or prior to a breakout. Um, creating microsites, so create microsites and, and brand them for your for your attendees. 
Um, digital live scribing, that's the picture to the bottom right. That's just a really cool way to um, to bring, to uh, outline the content of a session or a show and you can brand that. Um, swag room, this is probably the question I get most often is about the digital swag room or the virtual swag room. So I work with a company called Swag Guru. There's a lot of companies out there that do this, but this is just happens to be the one I work with. Um, and they will create a custom curated experience. So you can um, have all the swag. So, you know, my company, Phase Forward, may buy the water bottles and someone else may buy the buy the um, the conference bag and they put it all into one on one um, screen and they send you the attendee a link and they say go shopping. Right. I mean, that's that's kind of basically what it is. Or you can tailor it and say, OK, we want to offer I want to offer the board or I want to offer, um, you know, the leadership, um, just the leadership, a hundred dollar gift. And I, but I want them to choose. So they may pick 10 different um, options in the hundred dollar mark. They send the leadership, each leadership person or each board member a link please pick one item. So that way, if I'm on the board, I get exactly what I want and it's shipped to them directly. So it's a very cool experience. And we know a lot of people love their swag. So the Expo client. Um, I just want to touch on platforms. I Platforms are not my um, forte. It's not what I do. I always get a lot of questions on what platforms I like the most. Um, I like the one the most that I'm working with at that time. Um, but just to give you an idea of some different opportunities from a from a sponsorship perspective, the two pictures on the left are basically your directory um, ex like trade show hall, right? So if I, um, you know, that's kind of like a very simple format. Um, it, it's just simply a directory, or you click on the brand and it goes and gives you a little blurb about the brand. On the upper right is. Um, basically 2D or flat screen um, opportunity where it gives you a little bit more of robust. So you can click on, say I click on An Angela Jones, the picture in the middle, I can actually go to her booth. I can I can download demos I can or download um, uh, different content. I can look at demos. I can do a live chat. I can do everything from there. I can't do that. Any of that on the on the from the two directories on the on the left side. On the bottom is just an example. Hub is a great company. I work with a lot of them, so I'm not trying to advertise. It was just an easy picture, um, but uh, it, it, of a 3D option where you have a, you can have an avatar who walks in a convention center and you're looking around and you see the resource room, much like. Planet IMAX did. It's very cool. It's a it's a really cool opportunity. Um, pricing comes into play and really what you're trying to achieve. But those are really kind of the three or four different options um, from a platform standpoint when it comes to an expo. So the expo client, this is a th this client's a little harder to sell um, on the virtual because they they are trained that it is a face-to-face uh, -face opportunity. We're going to pull someone out of the aisle and we're going to, you know, they're going to see a demo. We're going to give them a tchotchke. We're going to sit down and have a talk with them. So to talk to, to have the conversation that virtual offers um, great opportunity as well is a little harder than the branding sponsor, right? So, um, the, but there is great opportunities for the Expo um, client sponsor. It's just different. Right. And I would say in some ways it's it's uh, more targeted. Um, so when you are uh, you're standing in a booth, we all have pulling people into our booth, trying to get them to talk to us. You know, that is not a considered a warm lead. But if I go to someone's um, virtual booth, I click in it, I start nosing around at their content. I look at a demo. I ask for a live chat. That is a warm lead. So that's where I think it's kind of cool that there is some opportunity. Um, here, just uh, from a sponsorship perspective, you can sponsor expert bars, banners, information desks, theaters. Um, once you get into the customized booth, that you within that booth, you can have live chats and content. So you can have content links and demos and message boards and infomercials. You can do pre-event parties. One of the cool things that I'm doing with one of my tech companies is we have a um, we have a virtual booth, and on one side 
is the demo and the live chat, just like you would see here. But then it actually turns around and on the back, we're doing some Ask the S Expert and CEO chats. So a little fireside chat on the back of the booth. So it's kind of cool. The other thing with Expo is you can um, you can still clearly keep your tiers. You can still have your bronze, silver, gold. It just depends on what their level of exposure. So if a bronze uh, may only have like a listing or a very small booth with just a, the directory type approach, where as you you know the gold may have a booth that has. Um, you can watch demos and you can download some content where the platinum you have live chats and demos and message boards and it just really depends on the level of sponsorship the tier in what they have within their booth so this is experiential and i put this made me laugh because i really feel like experiential has been very much like everything just being thrown at us the first couple months um but experiential this experiential sponsor is really you know can be really happy with the virtual experience there's a lot and and i'm sure we've all experienced in the last eight months really what we can do uh, you know peer-to-peer -peer chats are very cool um, contests, live music. We work. I work with a, lot, a company called Song Division, who does really cool um, online um, kind of name that tune and and um, you know finish the last line like it's a it's a music um, happy hour basically, and they they can do hundreds of people. It's a great experience. And then you know um, contests. You know post your favorite travel photo or you know, post a picture of your animal or things like that. There's a lot going on with experiential that can drive some great ROI. Again, streaming parties, live competitions, cooking demos, tastings, everyone's doing those. Uh, meal deliveries, there's a great company called uh, Eat Engage. Um, it's Eat, N-G-A-G-E. Um, and what they do is they organize everyone to have lunch at the same time and deliver it at the same time. So you could be sitting there um, online in a conference and everybody's having lunch at the same time. Um, so there's snack breaks, there's all kinds of things we can do. And the experiential client you know, is, is pretty happy with virtual because again, you get the ROI with that. So give back. Um, it, these two organizations, I, I you know, I find that over the last five ish years, most organizations um, have some sort of philanthropic um, type of attachment to their live event. Well, you can clearly you can do that with online, too. And I think it's really important to continue that. And most are. Um, but uh, here's two that I think are really cool. Um there's an organization called Snap Bar who does um, selfie bars, really awesome product, um, very easy to use. And when all this, when everything happened and events basically came to a standstill, they pivoted very quickly into creating this company called Keep Your City Smiling. And what they do is they create, um, they create little care packages from a specific city. So I, we use them. I, I worked with an organization, uh, a conference that happened this summer that was supposed to be in Nashville, clearly couldn't go to Nashville. So we created a care package of all Nashville products and sent it out to the attendees. So very cool opportunity. And then and they use only local businesses and small businesses for that. And then on the right is one of my favorite all time um, opportunities, just because I think it's such a no brainer. Um, fill it forward. So this is, you know, everyone has a water bottle at their conference. This um, organization, when you get your conference water bottle and again, branded from a sponsor, um, you it comes with a QR code and you download the app. You put the QR code sticker on the bottle. You zap the QR code every time you um, fill it up. So every time you fill up your water, your water bottle, and you zap the QR code, fill it forward, donates a, an amount of money to cleanwater.org or a handful of other organizations that you want to choose from. Um, it just kind of is a no-brainer. They pivoted very quickly, and they offer a virtual opportunity as well. So they can send out the water bottles, or you can utilize your own water bottles. And you can see up the upper right, it's a it's a um, uh, the, the the you can zap the app right there on your screen. Very cool opportunities. And then health and well-being. Um, I think this has become a big part of conferences where they're offering, you know, chair yoga or um, 
you know, 15 minute, 10 minute meditation um, sessions because people are sitting all day. They want to give them a mental break. And we've all seen that it's important to take that break. And so sponsor, this is a great sponsor opportunity. We're doing walks and run-ins in the morning. I work with this cool organization called HECA Health. They do great um, virtual walks and runs where they have the data and they'll create uh, opportunities where there's competition and all kinds of fun stuff. So um, there's a lot of opportunity um, outside of just your typical, you know, expo or sessions. Um, analytics, I kept this to the last and I, and I, um, I listed it out because this is what's most important to sponsors um, from a virtual perspective. They want the analytics. They need the analytics for ROI. Um, typically, and some organizations are better than others, but I'll say typically um, organizations don't normally provide this amount of analytics. And, and this is what I think is really changing because this will drive the revenue for them. So um, what you can grab from, what kind of analytics you can grab from a, um, a conference is so much more than it used to be. Everyone knows, you know, click throughs. But dwell times are important. How long did someone stay in your virtual booth? How long did they look at, at the demos? Um, what resources did they download? Is someone, do, you, you know, did you have 10 people download one, one white paper and none of the other ones? So clearly that topic is hot for your attendees. You know, there's so much, how, much, how long did they um, spend in your booth? How many hours of video content was consumed? I mean, these are important, uh, important data points. And um, again, sponsors really need this information to to realize an ROI in their sponsorship dollars. So the organizations that are able to capture this and um, provide it for their sponsors are the ones that are going to um, do the best when it comes from sponsorship. Their revenue is going to increase and they're going to have repeat sponsors year after year. So these are the resources. Um, the, again, I work with a lot of different organizations. These were just some of the ones that I mentioned today. Um, and that is my session. Back to you, Natasha. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you, Meg. I well, quick. <laughs> <laughs> We've actually had a really good number of questions coming. Oh, so great. I'm spoilt for choice and now in the, now in the driving seat. Great. Um, so I think this is rather a nice one to start with. Where did the name Phase Forward come from? <laughs> um, actually, I, I was in Napa, my favorite place. Um, and I was, uh, I, we were thinking, I was there with my cousin and we were thinking about, you know, what, does, what am I trying to achieve with starting this company? And it was really to help propel sponsorship forward. Um, I worked with a, a couple organizations and it was very much a commodity sell. And they would call and say, do you want to buy an ad in our newsletter? And then they would call three months later and say, do you want to buy a booth at our conference? You know, and it was and it just didn't make sense to me. And it didn't. I thought there needed to be a strategy behind that. Um, and so I wanted to propel sponsorships forward. So phase forward. I've not, been asked, I've not been asked that question in five years. So that's a good one. <laughs> well, I know the gentleman who asked it and he's got some pretty pretty good questions oh, good. so I'll ask his second one okay which is have you actually used or seen used podcasting for sponsorship revenue and community building yes and podcasting is a great way to I think podcasting is a great way for pre-event um, during the event and post-event Right. So this is where we talked about I talked about like virtual opportunities, the, the pre and the post event really is a smart way to maximize sponsorship. And I think podcasts are a great way to utilize that. Yes. And I suppose it's also giving the sponsor a voice, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, a way Absolutely. of engaging and, and, and making it personal because, you know, brand is not necessarily personal, is it? Right. Right. And it really gets them in front of people in a in a way that is comfortable for the attendee. Absolutely. Another very good question. Do you recommend a separate sponsorship for your live and virtual audiences at the same conference? 
Yeah, so I get that question a lot, and especially as we get closer to thinking of hybrid um, as you know the, an, as a very close option, um, it, 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 I will say that it depends on the um, organization itself. However, um, to me, at least initially, the first year or two, it may it it makes sense to go to have have them together. So um, when I would put a prospectus together, I would do, you know, my pre-marketing, my on-site marketing, my my um, in-person physical uh, or in-person expo opportunities, my digital expo opportunities, and then my post-marketing. That's kind of how I would put it together. Um, and, and have it, I, I'm, I, I'm hesitating on this because there's so many variables involved that are going through my head. Um, but I think it just makes sense to offer the sponsor um, to offer the sponsor more right now, uh, more of an opportunity. But here's what I'll say. They can't be the same. So what the sponsor needs to what they're offering in person has to be very different than what they what they're offering um, in their virtual expo. Yeah. Meg, I wish we could answer and, and I could put to you all the fabulous questions that have come in, but we are actually out of time. I so thank you for sharing all of your wonderful insights with us. People can find you at Phase Forward. It's a, not a hard name to forget. <laughs> um, this session will be recorded and will be available for, for everyone to watch again. I hope that everyone enjoys the programming on Planet IMEX. And until next time, it's goodbye from Meg and goodbye from me. Thank you.